Mascots, weird little fellas who speak for some of the world's biggest brands and institutions. Behind some of the greatest marketing campaigns of all time, you'll find these weirdos. They represent all facets of culture, from sports teams to breakfast foods to the US military. Some are cute, some are funny, some are absolute freaks. They're my favorite. There are thousands of mascots, but few are truly successful. Many think they're a risky and expensive form of marketing that can make or break a company. Leading marketing teams in the past few years to shy away from mascots. In favor of more strategy, trend, and influencer-focused advertising. Are the days of mascots over forever? Swallowed whole by the ruthless beast known as capitalism? I hope not. I'm here to analyze mascot history and behavior to answer the question, why? Do mascots fail? The answer lies through the lens of the ubiquitous 1990s video game mascot. This was a period where mascots experienced highs like Mario, Sonic, and Pikachu. And some lows, which we'll get to later on, don't worry. And before we get going, I wanna remind you to like, comment, and subscribe on this video. It helps me keep making cool content like this. Hit some of those buttons below. Now, let's get back to the video about Mascots. In this video, we're going to be explaining where mascots came from. Check out early mascot lore, tracking their stories across the globe to places like Japan, where mascots have gone to the next level, eventually leading us to the fail sun stars of our video. Hop aboard on this weird mascot quest. This is Dan Splaining, Why Mascots Fail. Mascots date back to 18th century France. The French word mascotte means lucky charm. No, not that one. Derived from the word masco, meaning sorceress or witch. The word was used to describe anything that brought luck, so it was used by gamblers, guilds, and shipbuilders. A mascot could be a rooster weather vane, a carving outside a business, or even a flag. It was further popularized following French composer Edmond Audran's 1880 opera La Mascotte. Following year, the word entered the English lexicon. This is where mascots became a more widely accepted term for good luck animals, objects, and human caricatures. In 1877, an Ohio-based oatmeal used a Quaker as their mascot. Today, we know him as Quaker Man, or the Quaker Oats Guy. He was apparently chosen because one of the founders was reading the encyclopedia, which is pretty big brain if you ask me. He came across Quakers and thought they sounded like nice people, representing honesty and integrity. Quaker Man stands as a powerful base of brand standards. He is one of the earliest known uses of a mascot for a brand, in this case, a human caricature. Our next story comes from the Ivy Leagues of Yale University in 1892, where the geniuses struck gold not with brain power, but with the first recorded animal mascot. This is Handsome Dan. No, not me, an English bulldog, although I see the resemblance. Legend has it that a student named Andrew Graves, who was a member of both the crew and the football teams, saw a bulldog sitting in front of a shop and purchased him for $5. Dan became a good luck charm for his teams and was eventually led across the field before games. The tradition still lives on today, as Yale's mascot is a real bulldog. Very cute one at that. Here's today's version of Handsome Dan. Our next important mascot comes from France. Have you ever heard of Bibendum? Me neither. I know him as the Michelin Man. A cartoonish stack of white tires and mascot for the French tire company, Michelin. He was introduced to the public at the Lyon Exhibition of 1894, where Michelin had a booth. Prior to his creation, the Michelin brothers Andre and Edward saw inspiration in a stack of tires. They eventually met with illustrator Marius Rossillon, who showed Andre something he had drawn for a Munich-based brewery. They suggested changing him to a white stack of tires instead. Beyond making tires, Michelin is famous for their travel guides. This positioned the Michelin Man as a lord of industry, purveyor of the French spirit. As cars became more widely available to middle class people, the Michelin Man was a perfect sales tool. A friendly face, no matter where you and your family are traveling to. Now, let's travel across the globe to our next destination, Japan. Japan has taken the mascot concept to the next level. They refer to mascots as Yuruchara, a contraction of Yurui Maskoto Kiyarukta. Sorry if I butchered that. Yurui means lighthearted, laid back, and unimportant. The term was coined in the early 2000s by illustrator and cultural critic Jun Miura. He claimed Yuruchara have three main requirements. It must convey local pride for a town or region. The character's movements or behavior should be unique, unstable, or awkward. And the character should be simple laid back, and lovable. Here are some of my favorites. One popular Japanese mascot is Funashi, who is responsible for this incredible clip. <laughs> 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 
Funashi represents Funabashi Chiba, Japan. They are a pear fairy who is meant to cheer up residents and promote their hometown. Funashi began as a simple illustration to promote a local business in 2011. After further illustrations and content began taking off on Twitter and YouTube, their creator decided to take them into the third dimension with a mascot costume. Just two years later, they became an official mascot for Funabashi. Another one of my favorite Yuruchara is Sanomaru, a dog who's a food samurai. He's the mascot for Sano City, Togichi, Japan. His helmet is a ramen noodle bowl and his swords are fried potato skewers, which are famous regional foods. Sanomaru helps promote local businesses through the power of Kawaii. Lastly, I wanna highlight Kumamon, this off-putting black bear. He's apparently the PR director of Kumamoto, Japan. Kumamon was created in 2010 as a part of a campaign to draw tourists to Kumamoto. Following the completion of the Kyushu Shinkansen train line, his embarrassed looking visage and awkward large physicality help him stick out in the kawaii world and has been rising the ranks of mascot popularity in the past couple of decades. He's even done collabs with the Michael Jordan of mascots, Hello Kitty, as well as being a popular react meme online. The purpose of Yuruchara goes beyond western ideals. Japanese mascots often represent the less glamorous but critical functions of society such as regional and city government, local worker organizations, or esoteric businesses. Most mascots in the Western world are conceptualized like the Michelin Man. A company works with an illustrator or an advertising agency to come up with a for-profit symbol. In Japan, the local government have been empowered to build their own identities through mascots, often through small businesses and grassroots means. So we know what the origins of mascots are. We've seen them perfected in places like Japan. But what about all the failures, mascots, who we likely can learn the most from? To find these failures, we need to travel into the eye of the storm. The 1980s and 90s in North America were the most saturated time for mascots. Companies saw the profitability and power of food mascots in the mid 20th century like Captain Crunch, Ronald McDonald, Tony the Tiger, and Mr. Peanut, and decided to create mascots for all kinds of products. Like batteries, kids' play places, fabric softener, and more. The realm of video gaming was no different. Pac-Man, Mario, and Sonic proved their power, and video game companies wanted in on the action. If they could come up with the next big mascot, it would mean billions in revenue. Let's explore where they went wrong, starting with Bubsy. <laughs> Bubsy the Bobcat was introduced to the world from his first game, Bubsy in Claws Encounters of a Furred Kind, from California studio Accolade. The game was originally meant to be made for Chester the Cheetah, the Cheetos mascot. But instead of paying licensing fees, they decided to make an original character, Bubsy, their mascot, instead. He was heavily inspired by early 20th century cartoons with a 90s flair. Take a strange, not much thought about animal and give them a random piece of clothing. Sonic has sneakers, Bubsy has a t-shirt. No pants or anything else. He's got Winnie the Pooh's fashion sense. Bubsy games are platformers, so they're not too different from Sonic. Cartoonish platformers where the main character has unique physical abilities. The games were on Sega and Nintendo platforms. Despite the similarities, the excitement for Bubsy was very high. He was named the most hyped character of 1993 by Electronic Gaming Monthly. Bubsy came with a very aggressive marketing campaign centered around him. The creator of Bubsy was effectively gambling his entire company's success around the Bobcat. Clearly Accolade was trying to make him the next Sonic. The benefits could be enormous. Things started very strong for Bubsy. Sales and reviews of his games were relatively good. A sequel and TV special were announced for the next year. Could this marketing campaign pay off? The very next year, Accolade released Bubsy 2. Many think things just moved too fast. The TV pilot didn't get picked up for production. The game was rushed and didn't have the same zest as the original. Sales and reviews were poor. Michael Berlin, Bubsy's creator, wasn't even involved in the creation of the game, saying, It just about killed the franchise. Bubsy 2 failed due to mismanagement of the character. Things only went downhill from here. As Bubsy in Fractured Furry Tales released in 1994 on the Atari Jaguar. Many thought it didn't really make great use of the Atari Jaguar's features. People felt like they just kind of reskinned the original Bubsy game. The nadir of Bubsy was when Bubsy 3D released for PlayStation. This was Bubsy's dying breath. Known as one of the worst games on the platform and honestly, probably one of the worst games ever made. Bubsy's mascot potential seemed high at points, but he eventually just became another piece of gamer lore, just like our next mascot. If you thought 90s rad mascots ended at Bubsy, you haven't met Gex yet. 
No, not the 100 kind. The mascot of Crystal Dynamics and star of his own series of games. Gex was actually a commentary on the oversaturated world of mascots in his era. Gex is actually a gecko in a platformer this time, not a mammal, and his first game was on the Panasonic 3DO. Later titles will be on PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and more. The plot of his game followed Gex through the media dimension to defeat Rez, an evil ruler who wants to make Gex his new network mascot. Gex has to make it through 24 TV channel levels to win. The game sold and reviewed well. It appeared Gex's mascot stock had risen. Gex was praised for its voice acting from comedian Dana Gould, as well as writing and comedic tone overall. The second game, Gex, Enter the Gecko, took heavy inspiration from peak seasons of The Simpsons. Scriptwriter Rob Cohen had formerly worked on The Simpsons and actually wrote the episode Flaming Moe's. But nobody really seemed to be that crazy about Gex in comparison to his mascot contemporaries. A third game followed, titled Gex, Deep Cover Gecko, which didn't sell well and ended the franchise. Gex just didn't really take advantage of what made him a unique mascot. He was meta, addicted to watching television, and wasn't a furry mammal. He could have been the first really popular gecko. Geico didn't debut their gecko until 1999. Crystal Dynamics definitely didn't have the same marketing budget that Sega or Nintendo did. Although Gex was well designed, written, and had solid media attached to him, he's really only taken on niche fame as a poster boy for the 90s mascot platformer. Getting mentions from big YouTubers like Video Game Donkey and Scott the Waz, who are basically just memeing on him. We've met a lot of mascots, but I want to focus specifically on why Bubsy and Gex failed. They existed during a huge boom for the video gaming industry in the early 1990s. That meant every developer with a decent idea for a game felt they needed a mascot. Which in a lot of ways meant copying Mario and Sonic. During the same era, we had Arrow the Acrobat, Rocky Roden, Artie Lightfoot, Titus the Fox, Ty the Tasmanian Tiger, Punky the Skunk, Jersey Devil, and those are just some of the mammals. There was also Bonk, Zool, Croc, Rystar, and Borf. BORF! Okay. I made Borf up, but you get the point. People had grown tired of these mascot-based games. The video gaming world changed a lot in the 1990s. So fast that it was really hard for development teams to catch up. Bubsy's first game sold well, but that success ended up being his downfall. There's so much economic pressure to outperform the first game that the original creators were simply stretched too thin. In the entertainment industry, there's immense pressure on growing brands year over year. That's why games get rushed out and development crunch occurs. If devs had it their way, they'd get tons of time to work on perfecting their game for release. Bubsy 2 had a completely different team assigned to it, and people could tell. The original team was likely busy developing other aspects of the Bubsy franchise. The TV pilot had potential, but ultimately felt too similar to other Saturday morning cartoons of the time. Gex had similar production issues. They swapped around the personnel involved in his creation a lot. And also rushed out his second and third games. His developer had other games in production at the time. So they didn't need Gex to necessarily make or break their entire company, like Accolade did with Bubsy. Because of that, there really wasn't as big of a mascot push around Gex, money-wise. In my opinion, these mascots failed because of three simple reasons. The market was way too oversaturated with mascots. People can only be fans of so many characters. Corporate earnings trumped creating a truly impactful character, and they just weren't unique enough. They gave off the same kind of 90s rad Bart Simpson energy that a lot of their peers did as well. All this being said, I think there's potential for another golden age of mascots in the future. Right now, people are growing tired of the way they're being advertised to. Influencer marketing is everywhere. Big brands slap famous names onto their products and shove it into people's face. If they're gonna do that, why don't they just create a fun and interesting character that they can stick with? One they don't have to pay a repeatedly inflated wage to. Future mascots can succeed if they follow these steps. They have to be unique to your brand or corporation. It can be as easy as the Michelin Man, a stack of tires, or as serendipitous as the Energizer Bunny, or as abstract as Gritty or the Philly Fanatic. There needs to be a justifiable reason for their existence. Michelin Man is a friendly face in an unfriendly looking place, a tire shop. The Energizer Bunny fits with their tagline, he just keeps going and going and going. The Philly mascots encapsulate the mayhem of Philadelphia sports fandom. They have to be timeless. You need to be able to look at a mascot and not be able to tell what time period they came from. A good mascot can last as long as the Quaker Oats guy, if done correctly. A lot of 90s mascots tried to be Bart Simpson, 
poster boy of the era. When removed from that time frame, they just don't have the same staying power. Well, what year do you think Tony the Tiger came from? Or what about these lemon lime dudes from Starry? Something that will probably stay in the early 2020s because they're just a clear pander to Gen Z. They need to be weird, strange, awkward, or flawed. This is one of the main draws to Japanese mascots. They have a relatable emotion assigned to them. Gudetama is a depressed, lazy egg. Sunny the bird is hopelessly addicted to Cocoa Puffs. Chester the cheetah is sublimely chill and cool. The laughing cow is joyous. Just give the mascots emotions. All right, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. I hope your quest has been a good one. Congrats on having a pretty decent attention span. So, how did I do? Sign off down in the comments below, and I will see you next time. Blech.